Hello, I'm David DeLima speaking to you once again from the historic Bragg residence here at the Public Schools Club in Adelaide, South Australia. Our message today is entitled Writing Letters to Newspapers and Members of Parliament. Writing Letters to Newspapers and Members of Parliament. Our opening quotable quotation comes from Cicero. Marcus Tullius Cicero, who in the first century BC taught us the pen is mightier than the sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. And of course it was up to the comedian Marty Feldman to remind us of his rejoinder. The pen is also considerably easier to write with. So today we will look at four areas. Firstly, the opportunity to communicate the truth. Secondly, writing letters to the editor of newspapers. And thirdly today, writing letters to members of parliament. And finally, testifying to the sovereignty of God. So we begin with the opportunity to communicate the truth. Christians in the democratic and free nations of the world, we have a great opportunity to commend our concerns in writing to newspapers and to parliamentarians. Now, in many other nations, this freedom of expression is utterly denied. Newspapers are often controlled by governments in those nations, and the civic authorities simply refuse to consider the needs and aspirations of the people. But in the democratic and free nations, political power is divided among parliamentarians. This gives a greater accountability, especially through the media, compared to countries where only a few people are in charge. And that division of political power it helps members of parliament to give serious attention to the views and the needs of the voters, or they will risk losing their seats. The privilege of free expression is rare among the nations, and it should be valued and utilised wherever it is allowed. Sending letters to members of parliament and to newspapers it's an important method of challenging the thinking of a society that is abandoning the wisdom of the ages, that wisdom which God has given to the world. However, it would be prudent for us not to overemphasize the Christian basis of our views. Sometimes it's wiser to focus on the evidence of sociology, history, psychology, for example, since these are also part of God's truth. In that way, we do not give the impression of, shall we say, religious fanaticism that could undermine the impact of our letter. Yet, of course, we are perfectly entitled to convey our experience and our Christian convictions as a testimony that may challenge individuals as to their own position before God. We are entitled to hold our views and we should not be afraid to share the Christian basis of our position, but it's good to be wise and prudent in our approach as well. Our letters ought to be clear and they ought to be concise, readable of course, polite, they should be accurate, factual, topical, non-defamatory, correctly addressed, signed, dated, and they should can contain the name, residential address and telephone number of the sender. Secondly today, writing letters to the editor of newspapers. 
You know, the letters column is one of the most widely read sections of the newspapers. And that column is especially scrutinised by the civic authorities, by intellectuals, by educators, and all manner of persons of influence, including parliamentarians. A letter to the editor may be worth the equivalent of many hundreds or even thousands of dollars in advertising spending. So it's a great joy to raise concerns that cost only the effort of considering, composing and dispatching a useful set of propositions. Alternatively, of course, we could pay for advertising at great expense or we could print and circulate specialised leaflets. Those alternatives are important. They have their place. But adverts, especially small ones, tend to become lost in newspapers, especially in the less prominent pages. Leaflets require time-consuming letterbox distribution and they may incur the common fate of the various unsolicited leaflets that often fill our letterboxes or appear under the windscreen wipers of our cars in the car parks. But a letter to the editor, if it's published in the newspaper, it has the great advantage of having competed successfully with the many items of correspondence that reach the editor's desk on a daily basis. So a published letter may have greater impact than material contained in a paid advert or circulated as a leaflet. It is preferable to submit letters by email. Uh, some people perhaps still use fax machines, especially if we are responding to the day's news or opinion. Newspapers like to publish letters that have current relevance. The contact details along with the suggested word limits are provided in the daily newspapers. And of course, the shorter the letter, the more likely it is to be published. Letters might not be published, but they can help to form a critical mass of influence upon a newspaper, leading the editor to print one letter of the many have been, that have been submitted on that topic. Writing a letter to the editor can be part of our faithful proclamation as God's people, whether we are published or not. At least the letter will be read by the person who edits the letter's page. Newspapers will also sometimes publish letters uh, online rather than in printed form. Though a letter may not be published, it can still be sent to parliamentarians or other persons of interest. And of course, one of the most famous letters to the editor was sent by a girl named Virginia asking if there really is a Santa Claus. This prompted the famous editorial published in 1897 by the New York Sun with the famously entitled, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, <laughs> claiming that Santa would live forever. But at least it demonstrates the profound potential influence of a single letter to the editor. So turning now to writing letters to our members of parliament. Most parliamentarians are deeply concerned, deeply concerned you know, to understand the beliefs of the voters. That is because MPs are accountable to the people, especially on election day. So they are keen to know what people believe. Sometimes MPs are unsure about their own position and they can be guided by voters who express a view. Nor should we feel somehow unworthy of writing to the civic authorities. They deeply need a reminder of what is good and right. They especially need wisdom. So as to resist the unrelenting actions of people who seek to influence civic authorities for godless purposes. In fact, 
many leaders do not have a basic knowledge of God's wisdom and they need a constant reminder of the truth. Leaders must be careful before forsaking the wisdom of the ages and they should know what principles have informed the ways by which we arrange society and its governance. Letters from voters also give MPs evidence of public concern. They can use this as a valuable tool when seeking to convince their own colleagues about what is right and wrong. Letters also enable good citizens to take up their duty towards government by calling authorities to account. For example, as urged by James Garfield in 1877, prior to him gaining the presidency of the United States in 1881. Now, more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities. If the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. So our letters may be typed or neatly penned. A neatly handwritten letter may be more impressive as it's taken time to produce. Our letters should also be written to the appropriate area. Federal issues should be addressed to federal MPs. State issues should be addressed to state parliamentarians. Meeting members of parliament as well as writing to them is also very important because parliamentarians tend to give more attention to letters that are written by people they've met personally. And finally today, testifying to the sovereignty of God. We give God implicit, that is unstated recognition, simply by writing letters that assert the truth, regardless of whether we specifically refer to God. That is because all truth is God's truth. As uh, we read in the first letter of John, the Spirit is the truth, 1 John chapter 5. However, we may wish to give explicitly stated recognition of God. This can be achieved as we describe his sovereignty, his plan, and his purpose for mankind. The sovereignty of Almighty God over the civic authorities uh, can be asserted as we draw attention to the following biblical observations. The civic authorities have been established by God, we read in Romans chapter 13, and they hold a divinely appointed duty. It's to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Not to impose Christian ideals relating to personal morality, but to ensure community cohesion and safety and stability. And further, they will be brought to account by Almighty God because they are teachers. They help society understand right and wrong, and therefore they will be judged more strictly, we read in James chapter 3. These thoughts may be somewhat frightful, but those who read them can never stand before God and say, we never knew. Recognition of God can also be achieved 
in a lesser manner by simply concluding the letter with a brief phrase such as God bless or every blessing or we're praying for you. Many parliamentarians, they think they can apply their own wisdom to achieve civic stability and security and prosperity. Some also attempt to uh, oppose the wisdom of God as though there will be no consequences. So as we share the Lord's wisdom with our parliamentarians, we can warn them of God's challenge. As we read in 1 Samuel chapter 2, it is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. And finally, letters authored by Christians will help to call our culture and its leaders towards recognising the author and perfecter of our faith, as the writer to the Hebrews described our Lord Jesus Christ. This is in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Our Lord who is sustaining all things by his powerful word, we read in Hebrews chapter 1. Let us always remember, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I'm David DeLima. Cheerio.